Hello to the latest episode of FUMO, Future Money, the podcast brought to you by CFT, our friends in the edtech world who are the producers of this podcast. This episode is sponsored by XBC Tech and supported by MFTA, MENA Fintech Association. Our special guest today is Paul Taylor, the founder of Thought Machine. Paul, welcome. It's been a while. Uh, yes, uh, thanks very much for, for having me on the show. It has been a while. It has been a while. Um, Gara, Paul and I used to run into each other a few years back. I think it was just in the kind of very early days of Talk Machine, wasn't it, Paul? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember you wrote a, wrote a report talking about banking in the future. And uh, I remember one year we weren't in it. And then I think the next year we, we were in it. <laughs> and then uh, I, I think we're very much part of many banks' thoughts about the bank of the future so we've uh we've, we've come a long way <laughs> that was like what 2019 2018 oh even earlier i think yeah was it even earlier yeah, I, even, I started even, that yeah. series in 2016 so yeah, when did you guys uh, set up when did you start pop machine uh it, so we started um it, so we, we, it's a timely uh question we are um within a few days of being at our 10th birthday so so the oh, company wow. was, Company was incorporated. The company started the business on June the 9th, 2014. So we're about 10 days away from that. Wow. Uh, as we currently speak, we're at the end of May uh, 2024 right now. So uh, so t- t- ten, 10 long years ago. It, 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 ten. Feels like, it feels like both a long time and it feels like it's flown by simultaneously. I know. That's amazing. 10 years. Gosh. Yeah, it must have been around sometime between 2016 and 18 because it was still quite early in your sort of entrepreneurial journey and thought machine that we we would have met but um just to level set and for the audience who are listening to this maybe and don't know your background or don't know what thought machine is uh, why don't we just give them a little bit of an introduction or a flavor um how would i mean i think of you as what poor banking software next generation banking software how would you describe yourself what is thought machine uh yeah it's it, so to give you some context of, of the company thought machine is a um, Thought, Thought Machine is a B2B fintech. We're, I mean, uh, sometimes we call ourselves a fintech company. Sometimes we just call ourselves a software company. Uh, but we build cloud-native core banking engines. And um, so the problem we're trying to solve is that uh, legacy technology is is uh, causes tremendous damage in um, in some of the big banks. It's uh, and and we can we can talk at length about what, what the particular problems are. But Thought Machine has built on its own a completely uh, new core banking engine. And a core banking engine has a few basic functions, but it, it runs the ledger in the bank. It runs the product engine with all the product calculations, and it does all the account management in, in, in the bank. So it really is the kind of nerve center or, or heart of the bank. And we, um, we've we built this cloud native all in the cloud. And with that, we can uh, save, the, save the banks the pain of having to run on the on ancient mainframes or or anything else. Just to take it down to like really basic level for people who are not in the space at all, like what is core banking software? Why does this matter? Well, I mean, what is a bank and what is money? It's, ah, it's, even it's, better. So, it, it, so if you pick up like a child's book about what a bank is, that yeah. is that is a much better definition of what a bank is than, than, than you'll I'll find that that any any financial services person will come to you because everybody gets gets mired in the complexity of it. Yeah, you know, and they they talk about regulators and acronyms and all this kind of uh, yeah alphabet spaghetti soup. But but essentially, it is somewhere to store money. It is somewhere where you can borrow and you can lend, and it is somewhere where you can move money, and it is somewhere where you can trust to do those do these things well uh, and do those. Uh, and do those things safely. So, in essence, you know, a, a bank takes uh, it takes deposits from customers, and it uh, and then it lends out those deposits uh, again, and it has a capital buffer to make sure that if something goes wrong, that it's uh, uh, that it's still solvent, and it moves money efficiently from one bank to uh, to a different bank. And of course, there's a financial, there's a business model behind that. So. Uh, when it takes um, when it when it takes deposits when it when you lend it money sometimes you lend it money at par sometimes you lend it money and the bank pays you interest and then of course when the bank lends it out it nearly always <laughs> uh, lends out at interest and there's liquidity matching when it does it that um, most 
of the deposits in the bank come from uh, regular people. Most of the lending um, goes into the commercial world. The deposits have short-term um, um, notice on them. Uh, the, the the loans could be uh, you know multi years, and the the bank manages all that and, and does it does it very well. So when we talk about the core banking engine, so we talk about the ledger in the bank. So the ledger is where quotes the bank stores um, the money. Now we have to acknowledge that that money doesn't really exist. Okay, so so the uh, I mean, it it it, it kind of half existed when people used to use banknotes. And you could at least point to a banknote and claim that the banknote was money. Now, a central banker wouldn't agree that that was money either. So, <laughs> but, yeah. but 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 if we just imagine that you go into a, a bank with with a bunch of banknotes and you put in the deposit, uh, the bank will chart you up as a liability, as in its liability to you, uh, and it will say it owes you a thousand pounds, which is the value of the deposit you put in. And then it will lend that money elsewhere, and the banknotes will leave, will, will leave the bank in, in the form of a loan. But the ledger r- records those assets and liabilities. And in essence, and in the modern system, there's no cash. It, 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 the payments are done electronically. So the ledger is, is, is the store of value. And that is the most important function of a core banking engine. It is the ledger. Now, it's critical to realize that the ledger does not represent where the money is stored or the assets and liabilities. It is the record of the assets and liabilities. There is no, we are not a layer on top of anybody else. There is not a big book in the bank. There's no bars of gold. Uh, you know, the, the ledger is the core store of value and the source of truth in the bank. Okay, that's the first thing. So the second thing is then, uh, um, we. it's important that we don't mix everybody's money up together, right? So, so, so you don't just throw it in, throw it into, into a big jar and then afterwards goes, oh, you know, how much did Mrs. Smith? Oh, oh dear. Uh, right. So, so we have a concept of bank account, and a, and a bank account keeps track of who owns which which entries in the ledger, and who owns uh, which deposits, and who owns uh, which uh, which assets in the bank. And um, at the most simplest, you have one person and an account, but most people have multiple accounts. And as you get a bit older, you have lots and lots of accounts and lots and lots of banks. And if you're a company, you might have thousands of accounts for for uh, for salaries or for payments or for different countries in different currencies. So 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 make sure all those accounts are 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 completely clean, all attached to the right entry in the ledger. It's all done super clean. And then the third bit is the product engine. And so when a bank talks about a product, it what it means are things like credit cards and mortgages and savings. And those operate. So if you've put money into a bank and savings account, then the product engine savings account, it calculates interest on that. It says, oh, so um, or base rates at 5% or something like that. And it will, every month, it, it will give you, uh, you know, a 12 or 5% of, uh, as interest. And it will it will uh, calculate the interest in that way. And it also happens on the lending side that it charges, um, it charges customers, um, uh, you know, it, it interest on the loan. And it manages all that exactly. And it manages that in a in a completely automated fashion, and in a good product engine like ours, it doesn't matter what the product is. It can be a uh, a trade finance product, it can be uh, a mortgage, it can be savings, it can be deposits, it can be a a corporate account. It all works in a single neat fashion, and it all takes care of itself. So those things are the three really fundamental c- components of a core banking engine. Not particularly complex in and of themselves, but it has to work all the time and it can never ever ever go wrong right and um and when you do that at super scale then that's what a core banking in the engine in the bank does and you need a good one or an up-to-date one or a digitally native one or how are we going to define it because the kind of products we expect today are hard to deliver if we have a core engine from the whatever, 1980s, 90s, 70s, that we are just building layer upon layer on. And I guess that's what you're trying to do, right? This engine matters because it determines or has a big impact on the type of services and products the bank provides. Yeah. Well, well, well let's talk about what the problems of the traditional ones are, the legacy ones. Yeah. So first of all, they're not real time, right? So typically mm-hmm. we've got two modes. We've got, got the, so, so the core engine... A legacy core banking engine mimics how a branch used to work. So a branch used to open in the morning and used to be open for business and then it used to close. And that's how yeah. a legacy core banking engine. So it accepts payments during the day, but at 5 p.m. or something like that, it stops 
and it just kind of thinks about things overnight. And um, at one stage overnight, it'll add everything up and it'll say, okay, this is how much money you've got and that's it. But if, for example, you set, you add, ask it at noon, how much money's in the bank, it won't be able to tell you. And uh, so so it, it adds it up at the, at the end of the day, which is what, which is how shopkeepers used to do it. You used to, used to go through the thing and then you would tally the books at the end of the day, sign it off and then you'd be mm. done. Um, so, uh, so, so that's one thing. Uh, so a second thing though is, um, Banks go down for dreaded scheduled maintenance. And uh, I was using, I won't say which bank, but I was using a bank at the weekend. And all day Saturday, it was offline because because they were upgrading. Now, we don't, so so just take those two, two small problems. So this isn't how we, we operate. So, you know, when we were young, television was on in the evenings, but it wasn't on in the day. It wasn't on at nighttime. And it just used to have a blank screen with a test card on, right? And, 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 but we, we don't want that anymore. The thing has to be on all the time. So, so the bank has to be on 24 seven. It has to take payments continuously and it can never go down. For maintenance or otherwise, it, it's all up. Uh, so we do that. And of course, we, uh, that presumes that we're in a single time zone when you're, when you're running a, a large multinational bank you have time zones and you want to accept payments all around the world uh, uh, simultaneously. You want to make sure it's, it's it's all there. But, you know, you still have to add up what's in the bank at the end of the day. So you, so you still do the accounting end of day process, but you can't stop the bank while you're doing it. Uh, what used to happen is you say, sorry, we're not, we're, we're, we're pulling on the shutters. We're going to add everything up. And then when we've done it, we, you can, uh, we'll open again. And then, yeah, well, th- this isn't going to work. Um, you know that Netflix doesn't doesn't stop and then say sorry have to have to reload the next film it's going to take twenty minutes and then we'll, then we'll give you a go it's 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 just always on right so so the uh, so look at those two problems and then you have well the, the classic problem of uh, silos in the bank so a silo in the bank happens when uh, you know savings and credit savings and loans operate here and uh, checking accounts and deposits operate here. And then mortgages are somewhat separate. And that that became about because banks, high street banks or retail banks traditionally just did um, personal lending and um, and personal savings. But but then they became more universal. And, for example, in many countries in the UK, for example, um, the banks, uh, the commercial banks didn't do mortgages and building societies did mortgages. And you have all these kind of splits, but, but that that's largely disappeared. So what you would end up in the current bank today is you'd have a mortgage platform and a credit card platform and a deposit platform. And this just adds far too much complexity. So in Thought Machine's product, doesn't matter, Thought Machine's uh, platform, doesn't matter what the bank wants to do. It's all on a single platform, credit cards, debit cards, loans, savings, the whole lot. And so 24-7. Uh, and, and then, of course, it's cloud-based. It doesn't work on uh, mainframes or any, anything like that. And you know, it, and it has a multi-service arc. Uh, sorry, um, uh, a microservice architecture, and so all the things that you'd expect out of a out of a regular modern piece of software. You put all those up, and there's an n- enormous number of differences between that and the old approach. Uh, all, all of this you built, and um, you mentioned about TV back in our youth. You know, TV would come on for a few hours a day, or children's tv would only be on for an hour a day like an hour and a half it would start oh, like yeah. it started around 3 30 3 45 in the uk and end by 5 15 5 30 um i think we're going to date ourselves now and i can't remember this is before gara's time but indian tv only came on like for three hours a day or four hours like the all the programming doordashans the whole programming was like Yet to like log on to Bangladeshi or Pakistani TV because they just get American stuff, and so they had a proper. Um, and now no one watches TV, right? I mean, we have twenty four seven. No one watches it because I guess we're watching Apple TV or Netflix or something. But the average age of a viewer of CNN or MSNBC or Fox, they're really old. And I guess that's the challenge that banks have as well, that banks basically have a lot of, because they make their money from older clients. And so this is kind of existential challenge that a lot of the younger clients or the smaller digitally native companies don't make a lot of money for banks. No. But they're going to be tomorrow's well, uh, yeah. big I mean, guys, right? Tomorrow's multinationals or tomorrow's um, middle-aged adults who'll be <laughs> making hopefully lots of money for the bank. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's very important to look at what, what's happening in the Challenger Bank space. So yeah. as, we st- as we stand today, Challenger Banks have not displaced large banks when it comes to, um, you know, being the systemically important banks mm-hmm. and the large banks still maintain the money. However, yeah, have really, really made a difference when it comes to the demographic you speak of. So, yeah. um, uh, uh, so personally, I use one of the UK challenger banks for, for, for nearly all my regular spending and ease of use and, um, and the complete absence of broken user journeys really yeah. very impactful. And when you don't have much money, then that's everything. You're not interested. You're not going to shop around for a better savings rate. You know, when you've only got a hundred pounds or so. So, so uh, that's very impactful. And then, then people come sticky on that, and then people get, uh, and then you know, people are now using the big banks for kind of the you know the more grown up sums of money and, and things like that. So that's it. The, the the large banks are responding, and with software like it, it, so. T.S. Annell, the CEO of, of uh, Monzo, we, we, we were on a, we were in a panel uh, uh, a while ago, or sorry, uh, and he said, you know, what, what's Monzo's success? Why did you have to be a tech company? He says you cannot build great user experience on on legacy technology, and he's exactly correct. The the banks have built, uh, the established banks have built reasonable digital apps, but the, it, it always runs runs up against problems because the core underlying technology mm. just is not built for that. Monzo have done a fantastic job, as have many other challenger banks, in building it, you know, from the app level all the way down to the infrastructure level, you know, a, a modern system. And with technology like Thought Machine, you, you can re- you can do the same. So the bank has to tell us to build a digital experience on top, uh, but you can build something that's uh, that's 24-7. And if you don't do that, then you're going to be in trouble because, uh, as you said, if the demographic just peels off and you never get contact with them, what are they going to do? Is they become more successful and, and and start to have more money for savings? But let's talk a bit about a little bit more about let's sort of dig into the building of the business. And I want to get Gaurav into the conversation. He's got more operational building experience than me. And Gaurav, do you want to like drill into the kind of how Top Machine got pulled together and how Paul came from his background at Google and elsewhere and I think Paul oh, had absolutely. no experience yeah. in financial services, did you? Or when you decided to reshape, rebuild financial services software? Yeah, uh, none whatsoever. Uh, but, but 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 I was uh, myself and my early team. Yeah, uh, we were good at cloud computing, and we had uh, so the the uh, the four of us had come from Google. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I was a, I was slightly strange. I was a research scientist and AI person at Google, but the other three were were hardcore engineers, and their core skill was yeah. uh, cloud computing. And so we had built we had built cloud computing systems at huge scale, and um, and so none of us were afraid of resiliency issues. None of us were afraid of how to build software at scale. None of us were afraid of the throughput and the transactional uh, volumes in banks. It, it, so and and when you're dealing with a, a um, so Will Montgomery, our our CTO, had worked on um, um, ad auctions, and you know ad auctions are super high volume transactional systems where pe- people are bidding on adwords in various auctions. And we think, and there's a ledger, and there's price mechanisms and things like that. And when you look at it, you think, well, you, you, it is easy, it is possible to relate that to the core banking uh, core banking problem of it, it, it's about doing very basic things, but doing them extremely well and never getting it wrong. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that that sounds like it's the right recipe for something in financial services. But thanks, thanks, Ryan, for that, and thanks, Paul, for joining us today. This is one of my favorite favorite topics, which is you know solving a major issue with technology, and you've demonstrated that very well. So definitely for the audience that we have for today, what I want to walk through a little bit more on your journey is how you built the product and services for your customers today, because. Core banking as a service and a platform is something that we take for granted today. But when you started it 10 years ago, you were one of the early pioneers in the space. So when you started the the business and you eventually grew it, you know, the conversation with people who had traditional core banking products and then had a Frankenstein model of other vendors stitched onto a legacy platform to do XYZ. 
the beginning of your journey, how tough was it for you to tell people, this is what we're doing and you should be convinced to do it? I can understand that you can go toe to toe with an IT and ops person and a sec security person, IT sec, and say, hey, our technology is extremely good. But from a business perspective, was it a very tough sell in the beginning or was it immediate? This is heaven. We need this ASAP. Yeah, uh, it, it, it was more of the second. Uh, uh, this is my third company. and uh, I've, I've learned a lot. And, and one of the things to avoid when being a, a tech entrepreneur is building something that is a nice to have, but not an essential to have. And or building something for too small a market. So, so when I started, I wanted to be sure that this is a huge problem, right? In other words, if you're going to go through all the backbreaking work of building a company and going through all the agony of fundraising and all these sort of things, <laughs> you need to know that if you get there, it's going to be worth it. The worst thing is to succeed and, and realize you've got a tiny market with 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 a with a small product that isn't going to sell very well. So, uh, it, so first of all, validate that the world's banks are there; they're not going to go anywhere. If the even if the challenge bank wins. Well, they'll still, and the amount of banking is increasing all the time as, as, as sorry, people do real time payments and people do contact this and cash disappears. Right. So the usage of the bank is growing up. The point of pain was, was enormous. I talked to many colleagues in banks and it's not difficult to get access to people. And they all said, yeah, the mainframes are really, really causing, causing a terrible damage. Uh, so, so you put all that together and then the, uh, and then, uh, so, we fairly clearly, fairly, fairly quickly got to a, a position where the banks had said, yeah, if you build it and we can move, we would like to do it. And then we got lucky because we were always cloud computing people. So we built it in the cloud and a, a, a large amount of skepticism wasn't about wasn't around us. It's about whether the banks would go cloud native. And there were many people who just said that that isn't going to happen, but we, we were perfect in our timing that we went about three years before the banks moved. So the, by the time the banks moved, we had actually built enough that it was credible and it looked good. And so, uh, and, and that really was, that really was good timing. And of course we've got good pedigree. We've got good, um, um, you know, skill set in this. It, it, so they trusted that we, we could do it well, but very early on, we had with large banks looking at us and going, and they were very, very, they were deadly serious about what we do. So none of them said, we'll just go to buy it on day one. But many of them said, if you build this and it works, we're very, very, very interested. And, and um, so that was there. Uh, when it comes to the, the um, business people in the bank, they're just as easy to win over because they're frustrated that they cannot get their products or their ideas live because everything is too slow, too difficult, too expensive. So you say, well, in Thought Machine, you can launch products in weeks, not, not months or years. And the and the cost of running the bank is far lower, and the number of people you need to run the bank is far lower, and um, and you can keep up with it with the challenge of banks. So it's a, you know, they're, they're, it, it's not particularly difficult to sell it to the um, uh, sell it to the business people. And so when you started building and you started getting traction, obviously there's demand for people to do it, so you have to scale the business up for that, which led to your subsequent rounds and growth, but. From a geographical perspective, because you're a cloud-based company, where are your main customers today? Was demand inbound after the first interests of customers and proving the technology works? Because just as you said, the pain points are the same. You want to launch products faster. You want to be more nimble. The costs are much more aggressively in line with what they want to do. Was it global immediately or was it regional? Uh, not interest? Uh, I mean, we started in London, uh, and London's a good place to start. There's lots of banks in London, and um, in in London, uh, so uh, so Lloyd's were a, a very early customer in London, and um, but we also started working with Standard Chartered very very early, who are uh, depending how they look at it, either a London company or a uh, or an Asian company, but 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 most of their business is is in Asia, and then in 2019 we expect we opened an office in Singapore. We were we were about. We were about to open, sorry, we were about to open an office in, in New York, but then the pandemic hit, so, so we had to wait a bit of time. But we got three main hubs, London, Singapore, New York. And of course, that's not a coincidence, but that's where the banks are. So um so we sell the banks and we got banks everywhere. We got banks in uh you know in Chile and Guatemala and South Africa and um you know in Jordan and Malaysia in New Zealand, Australia, India. You know, everywhere and everywhere in Europe. But 
uh, there's big hubs in uh, New York, Singapore, and, and London, and about half the banks that we work with are are accessible to those uh, the, uh, yeah, to those three areas. And um, I mean, there are always local market dynamics which say why banks want to move or why banks don't want to move. But in essence, when it comes to core banking, every bank has the same problem. So it's it's a it's it's a single solution to the whole market. So the question is, you know, you started your market leader, you're creating effectively core banking solution as a service. Lots of copycats, lots of people coming in, people doing cheaper pricing, people perhaps trying to innovate ahead of you. Apart from educating the market or proving out your model even further, what differentiates you going forward in your second avatar of the business? Because you start creating the market, you start establishing yeah. yourself very well, you start growing. Product life cycle becomes very interesting then because then I guess you're getting a lot of inbound requests. So what does Thought Machine now do and what does Thought Machine not do? Because I guess you provide a core solution and then each customer has its own unit for producing technology or you standardize your product and service globally. What's the approach you take? Yeah, it, we, we, we sell a platform and the platform is identical to every bank. Okay, so... It, 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 so so banking has got mired in terms of you know expensive and ugly customizations where where uh, a vendor a traditional vendor will sell a product and then customize it and then it all becomes a mess and, and everything's completely different so so we really try to avoid that are uh, we avoid it completely um uh, but in terms of there are new entrants into the market uh we don't really see too much of that to be honest um but mainly because most of the new entrants sell to small banks or sell to challenger banks. And we are, our business is mostly now with uh, the biggest banks in the world. So we deal with Lloyd's and Standard Chartered, as I said. Um, we've sold to Intesa San Paolo. We've sold to uh, JP Morgan and many, many, many other large banks. So just the, the natural way the business has evolved is we're moving up, replatforming the globally systemic banks and um, doing that at scale and kind of, um, we, we've got some fantastic fintechs and some fantastic challenger banks uh, as customers, but our, our main focus is really on the, uh, on the scale, the, the scale players, and the co complex banking needs of the banks, the, the very biggest banks. So, when you go into a bank and you get the bank as a customer, do they spread you internally through their geographical footprint, or is it each geographical footprint has a different? Uh, life cycle adoption when they say okay we'll standardize by using thought machine yeah it, it, it's probably it, it's different in every bank some banks have got a a, a kind of single global plan and, and they go for that and, and they execute on that and they're um uh the, the, they're very joined up other ones have distributed decision making uh, and you certainly get the case where you you sell the different parts of the bank and you talk to another part of the bank and they'll say well we're not ready but but that's fine um, we know if we do a really good job on part of the bank and then um, then in time when the rest of the bank is ready to move um, we will be the natural choice uh, but, but, it, it, but it varies and, and banks you know for example banks struggle with that problem because if they have a centralized decision making everything sticks slower and you know you've got the compromise but if you've got distributed decision making you end up with 20 different systems uh, a different one in every country so there's the pros and cons of, of, of both approaches. And what's interesting for you now is the next geography. Are you looking at certain large scale emerging markets? Are you looking at places like India? Are you looking at Latin America? What are you looking at as an expansion plan? Or is it mostly inbound now? You're looking at people reaching you for references and you do phased approaches on to how you can onboard them. Yeah, it, it's all of those, to be honest. Uh, um, we've got two banks in India. Um, we've got, I think, seven in Latin America. Uh, Latin America is, you know, uh, hugely successful. And Latin America and India are good because there's, I mean, it, it, there's, there is a banking industry, but there's always a huge move to get unbanked people, uh, proper bank accounts. There's a huge move to digitize payments and, and get all these things sorted out. So, so it's a very, very good time to, it, it, banking is an expansion play in, in those those areas. And it's, you know, it's very, very good. Every bank's growing. Every bank's getting more deposits. Every bank's getting more customers. Well, not every bank, but many banks are getting more depositors, more customers. And therefore, it's, um, you know, it, it's good to be part of a bank's, uh, a bank's growth and success. In Europe, the market is somewhat saturated, right? And there's, when one bank does well, it is taking customers uh, from a different bank. But, but that's, that's, that's less so in the emerging markets.
So what does the next two to three years look like for you? What is your focus when it's coming to business development, product build, and expanding the business? What is it? What is your personal task where you say, okay, team build, product focus, or where's your time being spent most? And what is your outlook for the next two, three years in building it out? Yeah, it's a very, very exciting time for Thought Machine uh, because we have done very well. We, we've sold to large numbers of um, systemically important banks. What is what is going to happen in the next few years is they're going to move at scale and do proper platforms. So, so multiple ones of them are going to move enormous amounts of their deposit based on the lending place on the Thought Machine. And, uh, you know, and, and this is... This has always been our mission and always been our goal. You know that we are we are running the main part of the bank, right? And uh, it's it's super super important because when you run the main part of the bank, obviously you're you're you've got more you've got more. They're running more in our software. We've got more business. It, it helps our business. Um, but uh, but the goal the goal is to build a platform that runs the the, the world's biggest banks and um you know we're we're at a, we're at a very very intense growth fit, growth phase of that right now so do you take a portion of your funding or you take a portion of your commercial revenue and you redeploy it into let's say r and d process do you have a separate r and d process where you look at what would be most useful for your customers for a two to three outlook whether it's ai algorithms llm engines looking at perhaps compression technology, security. Is that something that's just standard out of the box? Or is it something you say there's a separate team that's really looking forward? Because I manage it's very easy for you to attract talent who's from the industry in terms of ex-bankers or ex-technology providers that are very complementary to what you're doing. Can you tell us about what that looks like within Thought Machine? Um, yeah, I mean, we spend a lot of money in R&D. Right, so it, so we spent a lot of money in R and D, and part of that is because we've got a lot to build. I mean, we're super ambitious about what what we're going to do. A part of that is, is acknowledgement that many of the traditional vendors in the space have underinvested in R and D, and they had a good product fifteen years ago, and they haven't really kept it up to date. So, so you know, we spend as much as possible in R and D. Absolutely fanatical about product quality, and and that's what really makes the product uh, so good because we 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 spend way more proportionately than our competitors do. Uh, we really believe it makes a difference. Uh, at the end of the day, it is a prime driver for banks coming to us, and um, so we're you know th th that's a huge focus for, uh, for what we do. Um, we we do like to think we're a great place to work. Um, we we the engineering talent we have in London is extraordinary. So, so and again, we've got a great culture. Everybody work. Everybody who works in R and D works here. We don't uh, entertain you know offshoring models or things like that. Everybody works you know in person in the office. So we've got a really great teamwork, collaborative culture, and of course for people who are earlier in their careers, it's it's a fantastic opportunity because they can come and they can learn. And, and I think this is a great place to learn how to be a, a, a really, really excellent software engineer. Thanks, Paul. The last question I have for you before before handing back to, to Ron at this, when do you think we'll see you in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East region serving some clients? I'm sure there's a lot of inbound. Uh, yeah, no, we already have. We, we, we've got some banks. Um, I, I, uh, I can't say who they are, but we, we've got some smaller banks and we're talking to some of the very biggest banks. Uh, it's, it's again, it's an absolutely key region. There's plenty of banks, there's, there's plenty of money, there's plenty of interest, there's plenty of growing population, everything. So, uh, we do that. And, and by the way, we're, we're, we do a very uh, successful line in Sharia banking. We've got multiple Sharia bank, uh, banking products live. I, again, um, it, it's something where by traditional vendors, they, they don't understand that they don't know how to do it. Um, we acquired the knowledge. Uh, we figured out how to do that, and it's another uh, part of the market that that j just just is open to us. Well, congratulations on on your journey so far. Excited to see what you keep doing next with all the products and services using that R and D center. Someday pop pop by and see what's in the black box. So thank you so much, Paul. Thank Ron, you. it's back to you. Just just to wrap up, Paul, we were saying at the right at the start of this conversation. Your 10th anniversary is coming up. It's your third rodeo, I think you said. Uh, it's not your first startup. How would you, if you had to do this all over again, would you do it? Has it been, is it the, has it been the mission of a lifetime that you've been working on? This is like, or has it just been like, nah, no, no, no. sailed no. off on a yacht after Google? Uh, 
like leave the banks to the banks. I mean, there's some messy, complicated. Uh, no, I, 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 I find the whole thing thoroughly enjoyable. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's never, there's never a time when there aren't some challenges, but I find the whole thing, uh, tremendously enjoyable. I find it very, uh, uh, I find it very rewarding working in the banking industry. I think bankers have been very, very fair. Um, so to me, it's very meritocratic, um, mm. uh, because we've got a good product. It, it, it puts us in a, in an extremely good position. And I, I, I really don't have any complaints. I, I think building a company is a, you know, it's, it's a multifaceted, multi-skilled, um, uh, thing you got to do teams, you got to do fundraising, you got to selling, you got to do building, you got to do product ideas and marketing, you got to do everything. Uh, and so, uh, but, but I do enjoy it. I think it's hugely cr- creative. And, you know, for, for many years, I just wanted to build a genuinely great company. And I mm. thought, I think Thought Machine is a genuinely uh, great company. It's got a good vibe. It's got good product, good reputation. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to run it. It really is. Paul, it's been a pleasure to have you on on the podcast, on FUMO, on behalf of our producers, CFT, our sponsors, XBC Tech, and our supporters at MFTA, MENA Fintech Association. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your journey. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it.